Secret Lairs continue to be a place of experimentation for magic flavour, and whilst some drops have gone more abstract, Culture Shocks keeps things low to the ground and presents all ten Shocklands with brand new flavour located far from the streets of Ravnica. So, what flavour notes hit for us, and where else in the multiverse do we think would be suitable for these sought-after dual lands? Welcome to Magic the Flavoring, the Magic the Gathering podcast, where we talk about all things magic, flavor, design, and lore. I am your host, Andy Mann. Hello, this is Nathan Cancel. And today, we are going to be talking about Shocklands. So, it's that time again, Nathan. They've done another Secret Lair Super Drop. Uh, this one is called Dr. Lair's Secretorium Super Drop, which I, I quite like the name, I'm not going to lie. I think it's it's a bit Dr. Cool. Parnassus, right? And the, yeah, yeah. I can't yeah. remember what the full name of that 18-word that film was. The title Imaginarium was. of Dr. Parnassus, something that like that? That was it, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, Very, yeah. It has yeah kind so of I quite like it. it. Um, we usually do episodes on Secret Lairs because as much as even like what, a year and a half in, I still don't quite know how I feel about them as a product. Um, I know you're the same. Um, they do offer good flavor and they do offer new spins on things and they've done another super drop we're not going to talk about all the other super drops because i think there's one where they've done the mystical archives they've done for some mm-hmm. new cards which i mean those ones i think are a slight waste i know we said this last time with the um uh Kaldheim frames for yeah like, with the titans yeah, yeah exactly whatever like, that's a waste you've already got the drop. showcase like why are you then extending the showcase for the cards i like the idea of it i just don't think it's i don't think necessary. it's necessary it yeah, feels a bit necessary. cheap yeah, especially exactly. for the mystical archive ones when the mystical archive cards aren't even from the set yeah you could They're... have put these other cards in there already you could have just done doing? that <laughs> why yeah, oh idiot whatever <laughs> um we also spoke about the uh full text lands in a different episode and then there is actually a secret layer which i'm kind of sad we're not talking about which is the uh our show is on Friday. Can you make it? Whereas the one I instantly posters. went online and bought. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. I really fucking love that one. Like it's that was one. my, that was my, I'm not missing out on this art style one. Like I was really sad. I missed out on the party hard shred harder. Okay. Um, one, because it had like a very specific art style. And I've also got a Tasker deck that seems to always have one of these random cards that fit into it. And I really wanted like a deck mm. that has various different art styles in it. So I was sad. I missed out on the party hard. So I was like, I'm not missing out on this one. My, uh, um, my favorite one from that one is the gamble. I like gamble yes. a lot. Gamble is pretty. <laughs> uh, I'm very aware that this is another art-based episode <laughs> for our audio podcast. Um, I will drop a link in the description box below uh, to the Hipsters of the Coast article, which they break this down because Hipsters of the Coast do very cool articles. Uh, this one is by David McCoy, um, so you can follow along with us as well. Um, we're going to focus on the Shocklands ones today because I think as far as flavour goes, uh, the Shocklands one is the most interesting, really, because they've not changed art styles. They haven't put like new skins on cards or whatever. They've given us very straight down the middle Magic the Gathering land Shocklands. But every Shockland we've had ever has been from Ravnica. And these yeah. ones are not. They've done mm. the Shocklands as if they were from other planes, which is amazing. Yeah, so then instead of going like, oh, let's see how we can do a very alter the art style or a different card frame they've gone okay let's alter the flavor of the card right which i guess to some people they might be like oh they're just normal normal magic cards it's like well actually if you don't really like ravnica or if you want these um if you want your lands to have a bit more flexibility like in terms of flavor it's really nice that they decide that the only thing they're going to overhaul and then actually pay really close attention to really get really good artists to do um their versions of is the flavor of the cards mm. um shockingly we are a flavor podcast so as much as this is going to be <laughs> referencing to the art in there hey um as much as we are going to be referencing the art on the pictures, it's more a matter of like why they chose that specific um, plane, why they chose that moment. I think also that what's interesting is it's, it, I believe they're all showing like the planes now, right? There's no throwback as in, oh, we're seeing um, the plane from like, you know, 3000 years ago or mm-hmm. we're necessarily like seeing the future. This is like a now, a, mm-hmm. a here and now kind of thing, which is interesting for a couple of them. Um, and there's maybe a couple of options that they could have had they not done this convention and looked at like oh we could be do- looking at any time across the multiverse um, m- multiversal history maybe they could have had other options but i like the fact it's almost like a little glimpse of all the different planes a little check-in of going oh how's this going or how's this doing and you know yeah i think they've done a good job with it i agree so what we're going to do is we're going to run down each one of the shock lands talk about the flavor that they've got on them for the secret layer itself and then we'll also have uh, our own flavor picks kind of it got us thinking like where else could you find these shock lands if you had to put these shock lands on another plane or if you wanted to see maybe uh, a land or a sort of a moment in time geographically depicted on a shock land, 
where would they fit? Um, I think we were talking just before the episode, and I, I tweeted about this a couple of days ago as well. I have a theory that you could probably, if you slightly fudge the color identities for like the different gods, uh, you could put the shock lands pretty much to a card on Theros, and you could find a way to make them flavorfully fit Theros. I think only one of them uh, is Therosian. Uh, in the current sequel layer, which we'll mm-hmm. get to, but um, yeah, I I have made one of my sort of like alternate picks for you can make a shock land. I've made one of them a Theros based land, but I think I could have done it for each of them. Yeah, I think I've done one as well, actually, weird enough, and I've avoided it otherwise. Again, I think we said just before the episode, it's a bit of a gimme. Like they fit. I, I feel like the, the whole temple, obviously, the temple cycle was originally from um, Theros anyway, so there's almost mm. this prerequisite and expectation. Um, one thing that is interesting is they've managed to they kept the naming conventions just general enough that they have flexibility, which is obviously mm. why this is possible. They're not like, um, say, for example, the Mirrodin ones, like um, Bleak Cleave Cliffs can't really go in other places, and like and raise a razor grass and all that like some some lands are very specific to their play and these thankfully have the flexibility sure um, well the ravnica also has the bounce lands as well the Karoos, which exactly. are very specific they're azorius chancery and, and whatever so yeah i think they got their name conventions out there all right let's jump into it then so without further ado uh the secret layer culture shocks has 10 different uh, shock lands because that's how many color pairs there are we're going one by one. Um, just a quick note on who, if anyone's interested as to how they're releasing them. Uh, they're releasing them in five individual drops, or you can buy them all together. And the five individual drops come in the shards and mm. wedges. Uh, or is it just the shards? It's just I think the it's just the shards, yeah. 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 Um, that's a point of contention, right? <laughs> I feel weird. like you should be able to mix and match. You should be able to go, oh, I want, I want three, and you get to choose which three you get of them. I mean, realistically, if you're going to get these, you should probably just get the whole bunch, not only because it's cheaper, but also because why? Why do they do this? If you have to get, you get overlapping ones, right? If you get, mm. if you want to get all five of the individual ones, you get two of this, two of that, only one of this one. That seems bizarre in my mind, mm. but hey-ho, whatever. First up, we have Breeding Pool by Aleski Bricklow. Uh, Breeding Pool is the green-blue forest land, shock land, um, previously attributed to the Simic Combine, obviously, on Ravnica. And this one is found on New Phyrexia. And each one of the shock lands comes with a flavor text that kind of lets you know what it's about. Uh, this one is uh, where Jin Gataxius's ingenuity meets fucking ice cream van if anyone has listened <laughs> to this podcast that was, su- that was such a spice eight rack thing have you <laughs> we just start shouting at trains going by <laughs> if anyone has listened to this podcast i think it might have been a year ago that there was it might have been this time last year when i was sat in this flat in my bay window and i have an armada of ice cream vans that go by my bloody window and they always play stupid anyway whatever chill okay it's fine <laughs> If if that didn't get picked up on my mic and it's not on the podcast, people are just going to think I'm insane, but whatever. The flavor text for Breeding Pool reads, uh, where Jin Gataxias' ingenuity meets Vorinclex's inhumanity. And the uh, artwork depicts uh, a Phyrexian pod, very much like how um, Titus Lunter did the new uh, birthing pod. Mm. with their sort of you know it's kind of like the alien egg type thing and it's found in the sewers on what i'm guessing is new phyrexia it looks because we've never seen like the sewers really this is like this is like teenage mutant ninja turtles level of like big pipes with like ooze spilling out of it right yeah for sure i was like this is just the, that level in every final fantasy game that everybody hates where you have to double back through fucking labyrinthian um <laughs> bloody um, ca- um sewers yeah it, it 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 does look a little less metal than what i'd expect new phyrexia to look like but where else could it possibly be unless it's weirdly hinting at them being on another plane already kind of like how we saw voron on um Kaldheim. i don't mm. think that's what they're going no. for um, it's just hard to tell because even the humanoid figures that you see in it, because um, there's humans for scale in this. Like the the, the pool is freaking huge. Yes. Like it's a, like a double swimming pool kind of size. So um, it's hard to tell specifically. I think it's deliberately ambiguous, but yeah. Yeah, it's very cool. I quite like the um, the merging of the two different uh, praetors because the praetors are usually seen as being like actively aggressive towards each other as they're trying to prove that they're sort of philosophies about Phyrexia is, is correct. But really, they're all like fighting for the same team. Right? It's all for Phyrexia. And I think we are going to start seeing that within their storyline moving forward as well. So it's kind of cool that obviously we've got Blue and Green, Jinkataxius and Vorinclex helping out. And uh, yeah, I mean, Breeding Pool. Very cool, very cool. I was maybe thinking they could have hinted that this is where Atraxa was born from. Like that mm. might have been a nice hint because obviously Atraxa was the fusion of all of the Predators apart from Urabras. That's why she knows she's those four colors. Um, it would have been interesting to see if this was like a hint to like that's where she, where she came from. But again, yeah, it was really fun to see the pre- the Predators working t- with, with with each other. 
Mm, very cool. Where else would you put a breeding pool if you had to? If you were in charge of the secret lair and you were like, right, you can't use any of the ideas that we've just had. We're doing another mm. shotgun secret lair with the same idea. Where would you put breeding pool? So my initial idea was um, Ikoria because of the like mutation aspects of the beasts on the plane. But the problem mm. with that is that that's more um, natural occurrence, whereas breeding pool kind of denotes like a science. So my actual answer is Bablovia. Um, in the crossbreed labs now i know they're actually the um white green color combination rather than the blue green it's the only other place i could think of other than you know simic that was like deliberate actual fusion of animals together right you know with the whole augment thing and it'd be nice to have a black border bavlovian flavored card um in my mind now do i think that's better than the than the phyrexia probably not especially when they want to hint at it going forwards but i think if this was like there's if there's a time to try and hint at uh, bavlovia then i think secret is probably the best place to do you it. love bavlovia don't you it's like you mention it every couple of episodes you talk about the silver border plane <laughs> yeah <laughs> i don't know why i think it's because um there's always there's always this idea that a lot of the um ideas they put forward with it uh, in bavlovia are kind of like the staging grounds before they put mechanics into natural sets like we saw mutate uh we saw contraptions kind of being like lesson cards um so i don't know i, I just i also just like saying the word bablovia like it just sounds really cool um sure but yeah yeah, crossbreed labs just made sense to me. Breeding pool, you know, fusual, fusing squirrels and monkeys together. Um, and... I also went for a courier, but I actually stuck landing with it. So I've done a courier as my breeding pool. So I've done because they've got the the wedges shards wedges what? wedges yes <laughs> yeah the ones that are target but they're not target right um yeah. and what i've went because uh zagoth is the salt eye one right so that's mm. blue green black um i've not done i've not adhered to the color uh sort of pairs exactly and we'll see what i mean going forwards um but i just thought the zagoth uh triome which is where you have uh brokos who which is the very natural very uh, sort of overgrown section of Acoria. And there's this kind of idea that it's the sort of primordial swamp of Acoria because Brokos mm. is said to be older than any of the other Apex creatures, right? All of the Apex monsters on Acoria are ancient, but Brokos is said to be almost like the first living thing on Acoria. So I just like the idea that you have these kind of pools and swamps in Zagoth that things can kind of just kind of, you know, crawl out of. And as you say, the mutate aspect of it seems pretty cool. So I, I went for Acoria as my mm. uh, breeding pool. But yeah. Cool. Um, all right, I guess next is um, Godless Shrine, um, and this is art by. Oh man, I've managed to get this out of order. Oh, I have. I've gone way out of order. You've gone way out of order. I've, I've, I've skipped like three ahead. I don't know why I did this. I think it's because I happened to really like this one first, and I had an idea for it. Anyway, Godless Shrine by Elena Danner. Yeah, um, Elena Danner. So this is a really cool artwork. It kind of shows um, the horns of Bolus on um, Amonkhet kind of starting to fall into disrepair. Um, the flavor text being the second sun brought nothing but darkness. Mm. But that's really cool. I like that a lot. What I think is really interesting is it kind of shows that Bon Wallace's power because he was able his but just by being alive anywhere in the multiverse, he was able to maintain that illusion of the horns always being in the center of the sky, right? And no matter where you looked on Amonkhet, they would always be there. And then as soon as he's, you know, he's not necessarily dead, but as soon as he's fallen out of um of, of favor and his power is diminished and mm. taken away, it's was that at that point his ma his magics across the entire multiverse have started to disintegrate, which is really interesting. Um, a really, really cool idea. Um where did yeah, you... I, I well, I quite like this one. I, I just like the fact this is, as you say, this is one of the ones which kind of proves that it's Amonkhet as it is now. Because as you say, the horns are in yes. disrepair. They've been like one of them is kind of cut in half and crumbling away because Bolas isn't there, sort of maintaining any kind of hold on the plane. Um, so yeah, I quite like it. And also, we've had so many lands with these horns on them. It's kind of nice to see them in a different way because we had them on the um, uh, the full art um, basics, yeah. basics, right? Which in Amonkhet. Um, where they were kind of all pristine and lovely. And then in Hour of Devastation, which was the next set along, it was exactly the same viewpoints, but everything was decrepit and fucked up because, mm. you know, the Hour of Devastation had occurred and the Hour of Promise and all that kind of stuff. Um, so it's kind of cool to see even further along now that, you know, none of the bloodshed is actively happening. We get this kind of different view of these horns and it's it almost looks serene, but decrepit at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. I guess there's also this tongue-in-cheek thing, right? If it says Godless Shrine, because mm. he never he never truly got back to Godhood, mm. so it's almost like, a, like another little poke at him, like they did Tiamat and made him made her a dragon god. It's almost like, ha, fuck you, Bolas. I know you're not around to argue <laughs> back anymore, so let's really rub the salt in the wounds, you know? Um, um, yeah, yeah, playing around with that name convention actually kind of moves on to the one that I would put if I did Godless Shrine. So if if we have this one, the Bolas one, of where it's a Godless Shrine because it was a shrine to a god who turned out not to be a god, it was like a, all a lie for the sake of trying to get um, Bolas's ultimate power. 
and if you have the godless shrine from Ravnica, where it was a religion that maybe had a sort of sense of um, sort of deity beforehand, but really it's a godless shrine because they've corrupted what the image is. I thought I'd go down a different path. So I've done a godless shrine. This is my Theros one. So I put godless shrine on Theros. Now, usually you would think that this would be for Athreos because he's the black white god on on Theros. But I, this is the one where I've kind of skewed the color pie a bit. I was thinking it'd be nice to see an altar to a god that no longer exists on Theros, because there's this idea that in Theros the gods don't the gods aren't forever. They're only there because of the devotion given to them by the people, and that's how the magic of Nyx works. So there have been gods, which have been gods once, and then they disappear. We have uh, Crufix in his story talking to his acolyte about how Heliod wasn't always the sun god, and that there were other gods as well. But these physical altars must still be around to the older gods, even if the kind of faith isn't around to make them manifest anymore. So I'd quite like to see a shrine that literally doesn't have a god anymore. And we can sort of, when we can sort of see, like, maybe it's the trappings of, like, I don't know, like it's the god of like cobblers or carpenters or you know whatever it could be and you know we don't actually have a name or an image of them or maybe we do get like a carved image of them and we can see a god that's maybe not on a card anymore someone suggested because i mentioned this on twitter someone suggested it could be a a shrine to xenagos because xenagos is kind of left now and he's no longer a god which is kind of a cool idea as well I guess yeah. that mirrors the idea that Temple of Abandon was originally um, Clothis's um, mm. temple, and obviously now she's come back again. Uh, that's a really cool, interesting, an interesting idea because I fell for Theros as well as like my um, my like final one. I did think about maybe like because um, it had a bit of a hint of Shrine of the Forsaken Gods. Maybe it's like a bit Eldrazi themed or Temple of the False God. Maybe a Corona themed of where they mm. they were worshipped as gods that weren't really gods back in the day because those tropes have already been played i kind of moved away from that i also thought for a second maybe the temple of aklazots like the, the back gods and maybe yeah we see, i thought so too and yeah. we see maybe the gods actually left because i know we got a big hint of it um if our grill's blood fast like we do technically get like the temple of aklazots but um we never see the back god it would have been a nice hint that maybe when we go back next to ixalan we there's like um a confirmation that the god does exist but it's no longer trapped within the temple right that would have been quite cool what i did fall on was also theorist but the idea that the word of heliod's deeds and eventual imprisonment have kind of spread right ajani's succeeded in debunking heliod's um status and obviously with elspeth succeeding at imprisoning him um at the end of the theorist beyond death um story arc i would like to see his temple abandoned in the same way of temple of abandon is of where Ooh. it doesn't have a god anymore because no one believes in him anymore yeah, you know, and that has the bl- it has the white because he's the sun god, but it has that black because of all of the shit that he did, right? <laughs> so I was like, uh, for me, I was like, okay, that kind of plays into theorists, but not like just going, oh, cool, yeah, another, another, and potentially another temple, but more like a statement of how people's belief system works, which I guess yours is the same thing, right? Of where it plays into the trope, but kind of subverts it a little bit. Of of not every shrine has it can be remembered, mm. you know, not every deity is still within the forefront of everyone's minds. Um, yeah, I'm glad that we kind of fell in the similar similar vein for that one. Yeah, very similar. I like it. Uh, next up, we have Hallowed Fountain by Rujin Gao. Uh, Hallowed Fountain is on the plane of Kylum, uh, and the which is the Battle Bond plane, and the flavor text reads, Two statues stand watch over the entrance to Bala's Reach, celebrating its twin founders and its first champions. So this is uh, depicts a huge... A pair of statues which uh, again they've got humans for scale so the the statues are easy, easily like 50 60 feet in the air um yeah. if not more if not way more um giant statues as they would do on kylum because we've got a few of the lands from kylum where we see the stadiums like on doubling season whatever and these are huge structures because everyone goes to see these battle bond tournaments um and yeah the statues double up as fountains with the waters pouring out of them uh i don't know if rujin gal's done any other work in the game in fact, I am literally going to look it up now. Uh, but I really like it. I really like the the sort of look that we don't actually see both of the statues facing forwards either, like because they, they're back to back. So we've got one facing out and uh, one facing away, which is pretty cool as well. Oh, he's done. Uh, uh, they've done Cross and Verge. Cross and Verge. Yeah. yeah, literally doing the same thing. Yeah, I didn't recognize recognize the name either. Um, so yeah, very confident yeah. to only have a couple of lands. Um, nice little bit of flavor as well because Kylum didn't really get much if any narrative because it was one of those like ancillary sets like even um what you call it conspiracy got a few stories but i don't think battle bond did and if it did i completely missed them so it's cool to see yeah, fiora feels fiora feels really fleshed out kylan feels woefully kind of forgotten yeah you know, well it's just because like... it's just in one place it's only the stadium that matters um i've yeah. got a question though if you're the founders of a sport do you get to be its first champions <laughs> that's a bit cheaty isn't it <laughs> 
yeah right like you're, you're the only person who knows the internet it's like oh no it's in the, it's the that, that's not part of the rules it's like what do you mean that's like, well we're the only ones who know them so yeah. like, you just gotta believe us you just gotta trust us right uh, well this is gonna maybe annoy quite a lot of our <laughs> listenership and i do like american football but it's like when you call uh the um super bowl champions the world champions and you're like you only pull teams from the nfl <laughs> yeah and, and no one else champions? invited yeah exactly yeah. <laughs> Uh, the NHL doesn't it's... do this, a, a similar thing, weirdly, but uh, there we go. Mm. Well, it's funny that you mentioned doubling season because these two guys are specifically. God, I say guys, we don't know, actually know, right? Because we can't no. see the other person. They I mean, they're they're female. wearing they're wearing what I would say is male dress. At least the one that's facing forward is wearing what I'd call sure. a male tunic. But yeah, no, yeah. there's no information about them other than the fact they're twins. Also, kind of cool that they're twins because of Will and Rowan. This is the thing, right? I guess this could be confusing to some people where no, the, the Kenrith twins weren't the founders. This isn't referring to them. Um, that's, I mean, we don't even know a time scale, right, of how long this tournament's been going on for. We don't like, even know really like... how well they did. Did they do well? Well, for, yeah, for the twins themselves, yeah, we have no idea. We know they fought Gorn and uh, Virtus, but apart from that, we didn't really get much. We just give us give us the bloody sitcom side story of them when they're going through um, Kyle M, and I'll I'll be happy. You know, like, just, uh, just a little the, sec- the second half of uh, the first series of Pokemon, where Ash goes through the Indigo Plateau. Just give us that. Exactly. Just give us that. I mean, who's going to complain about that? Ain't no one complaining about that. Um. <laughs> where uh, where else would you have Hallowed Fountain? Because I think this is quite a good bit of flavor. I think it fits quite nicely and gets. I, so this is one of the ones that I was like. I wouldn't have ever chosen Kylan, but is, there's a lot of random uh, tidbits you could have gone for that this would have fit fit for that allow us to have a bit of a view on a plane that doesn't um, otherwise have some. So I wouldn't necessarily want to move it. If I did, um, I thought about, you know, Radiant Fountain from Innistrad, potentially, even the Tyrite Sanctum from Caltime, but that's already on a land. Um, the one I fell for, um, and this was the, I, I was thinking maybe like Rabia or Amonkhet, like the prevalence of like an oasis within a vast desert. So I thought, you know how Crested Sunmare is thought to be from Horse Town at the other mm. side of the, the plain of Amonkhet? Let's see the fountain from that town. And then maybe it hints that maybe it's not a large populace. Maybe it kind of hints at something, a touch of, of there being like a, a populace outside there. Maybe it just shows the horses drinking from it. And it's this, mm. you know, this spring in the middle of um, in the middle of the desert. I think that'd be quite cool. Again, giving us a hint of lore that we otherwise wouldn't have known about that we might not get to see. Um, that was kind of like where I went for. It would feel yeah. much less structured. It wouldn't be like architecturally built. It would be more like a natural formation. Um, and it's like, as you say, that, that, that an oasis to, to a traveler in the desert is the most hallowed thing you could possibly think of right i agree so, yeah, i think that's... that's very cool um i went a bit more down the down the middle with this one i went to the plain of innistrad and i thought we could see maybe a monument to bruna who was uh the blue white angel as part of the flight of sisters uh the angel mm. sisters from innistrad just because like innistrad we i know we're going back there at the end of the year so we will get to see maybe some getting back to normal and maybe some toppling of old idols and i don't know they, they might play with some stuff there but the fact that bruna and gisella literally became so evil that they turned into an eldrazi horror angel yeah. <laughs> do you know what i mean Horrorization happened that fusion blah, yeah. that was such a horrible story <laughs> it, it would have been maybe quite nice to sort of and almost kind of um sad in a way to see uh, an old shrine to Bruno because the the sisters the angel sisters even though Avacyn was kind of like the ultimate force for good on the plane until she wasn't um the the angels were kind of venerated in their own right and had flights of their own right that kind of went around mm. doing things for the humans of Innistrad so yeah so I thought that would have been just nice to see maybe like a decrepit monument or a decrepit fountain that that kind of shows Bruno and maybe some of the other angel sisters I think that would have been cool Hallowed yeah, Fountain is really like the one of the most generic names out of all these I think um, well, it's funny you mention that because I think we're going to move on to the most generic one out of all of them. Okay. Um, by my personal taste, um, and that's a uh, Temple Garden um, okay. artwork by Tyler Jacobson. Oh man, Tyler um, Jacobson's been on fire recently as well. Yeah, it's a really cool artwork. So it shows um, the Temple of Karametra, um, kind of. It doesn't even show it in full. Like it doesn't give you the full image. It only kind of gives you like the driveway up. Like, it's got a little avenue of trees. Um, it shows her kind of very similar to how she's uh, seen um, in her in her natural cards. Mm. The flavor text reading: Karametra's worshippers know that one one must plant countless seeds to ensure a bountiful harvest. Um, this would have uh, worked really well in my Karametra deck, even though the fact that I might be taking apart my Karametra deck very soon, so I'm quite annoyed about this because this is. It perfect. might be a hint to tell you not to. You know that yeah, might, this maybe. might be the sign. Might be the sign. Um, the only thing I said, so the thing I don't, I didn't necessarily, I, I would have liked to see more of this is that the temple side of it, I'm sorry, the garden side of it, like, um, the main reason I say that is because I've got a play map from Elena Dana, um, the one that's the MTGO, um, exclusive artwork for Temple Garden. And it's like, mm. for me, that's the perfect fusion of building and, um, fauna. 
all right whereas this feels like it still separates the garden and the temple aspects a little bit um as much as i think it's really pretty artwork i feel like the garden is like it's not got flowers there's no flowers in there there's no vines or anything i mean there's maybe like a little hint of it in the background of the, of the but like it's like a, it's a road with an avenue of trees like as much as that is okay yeah the temple is the first word for me i would have liked to see the garden side of it elevated maybe a little bit more and this maybe. is why i maybe think the theros is a bit of a gimme because if you can focus if you focus on the temple side of it it kind of takes away the individual even individuality of it like i could have seen this artwork just lifted directly onto the temple of plenty for example and mm. have been no issue whatsoever i think that's my only gripe like temple garden doesn't necessarily give you enough nuance so it can feel maybe a bit more bland sure um, i quite like this one if only because um Karimetra, out of all the pantheon of gods she's one of the ones that got the least amount of uh, story to her in terms of like looking mm. into who she is and what she's doing and um Karametra and phoenix are uh, might would be my picks for like the two most interesting gods out of the pantheon that aren't like the monocolored five like main ones like mm. she's her kind of uh duality between society and cultivation which completely rubs up against nylea who's like her kind of godly sister if you like the fact that she has like a scythe and the fact that she's also got this giant sable that she kind of sits on and this throne. Like, sable I think... when? When are we getting this legendary creature? It's not fair. <laughs> Give us the sable. <laughs> well, there, I mean, there are. There's what? It's bronze sable is actually a, a creature, but it's like, it's not. Yeah, but I want like a, I want a colossal horizon striding sable. Okay? That's true. Like, that's don't true. give me a half measure. <laughs> but I just sort of think like she would be, if I was, if we were to go back to Theros and then like, right, we need a new god to kind of take up the kind of um, antagonist sort of like uh you know big bad but benevolent big bad god of like the set i think karamach would be like a perfect fit for it because she's very much like is this whole thing with green white it's the same thing that you see in the selesnia and ravnica as well is that they're all like very combiney hips uh, like hippie-ish like you know oh let's drape a daisy chain around your head and dance around and whatever and then you're like oh why have you got a bunch of like armor and swords and trained warriors in the background oh don't worry about them here let's dance <laughs> like you know they've got this kind yeah. of underlying uh, militia aspect about them because they're gonna they're going to protect their combine by any like you know mm. way possible you've got to, you've got to fight for peace right well this is it i think that's very much the green white <laughs> aspect is that it's that weird dichotomy of going well ha can you really have peace if you don't have the means to violently defend you <laughs> defend it um mm. so yeah um so i quite like the fact that karamech has got it um i would put Karamet i would put uh temple garden on tarkir this was my tarkir pick uh, again, going for like the tricolor, but seeing a certain aspect of it. Because the Abzan, which are the black, white, uh, green uh, tr clan on Tarkir, um, I would have my sort of oasis moment. A little bit like how you were saying about the, the Amonkhet oasis for the Hallowed Fountain. I would mm. have a temple garden being part of the Abzan's kind of like oasis in the middle of the desert. Because they they live out on the steps on the kind of like the barren sun-baked kind of desert areas but then they have these huge high walled fortresses that inside there's like trees and you know growth and water and all this kind of stuff so i would i would think that'd be quite a neat fit of having the t i mean temple i don't necessarily know the temple sounds more like a jess guy thing or a soul type mm -hmm. thing but i think it's still kind of fit where you'd have yeah maybe just a sign of oasis in amongst the desert very much like how a lot of the abzan lands kind of rock out but i think that'd be kind of kind of a cool fit yeah. no i like that i was trying to i thought the same thing i was trying to find because of the word tempo i was thinking of tarkir as well but i couldn't really settle on where to see them i didn't really think about the idea of of course they're going to have some areas that are going to have um fauna and, and and vegetation so yeah that fits quite nicely mm. um my choice was some so so what i was saying initially about how i'd like the folks to be on the garden side i was thinking when i think temple garden i think like babylon you know i feel like the hanging gardens of babylon that kind oh, of sure. thing i was trying to think of where would fit for that i was thinking maybe initially i was thinking maybe fiora like you see like like the ed edge of the world paliano that you know like the high city of paliano kind of sits above um mm. Of the rest of the city i would have liked the like, almost like the edge of the world where it's kind of cascading off but then i realized that arazka is a literal overgrown giant temple in the middle of a jungle so i like this idea of where as this as all the as as all the spires and everything erupts up like all of the fauna and everything starts you know still drapes down and has all of this hanging garden effect and i feel like that maybe fits the visual of what i want more and like this idea in like shining resplendent city-wide garden temple kind of thing of where it is still focused on the overgrown aspect of it rather than the building aspect of it um that's kind of where i went for i was trying to try to fit in kamigawa um with this as well but i mean i think i do that a little bit better later on i'm not trying sure. to shoe in kamigawa into anything i promise <laughs> <laughs> uh next up we have watery grave by victor adame minguez um this one's a bit grim uh so watery grave uh is set on ixalan this time around 
and we see a shipwreck with a bunch of floating dead pirates in the water. So it must be quite a recent one because they're still uh, still intact, as it were. And it seems to be a uh, ship graveyard, so it seems to be an area of the sea which many ships kind of crumble and fall. Um, the flavour text for Watery Grave reads, Aye, ships go missing in the stormwreck sea all the time. That's why we don't call it the calm, safe current, Captain Lannery Storm. Uh, hey oh, really, cool to see Captain Lannery Storm back as well. I think they were on a couple of flavor texts, mm. and they obviously got their own card as well. Um, yeah, brutal, absolutely brutal. I that's, yeah, very clever play on words. I quite like that. That was like that's why we don't call it the calm, safe current. It was like, it's, I quite like that a lot. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. And uh, yeah, Victor Dummy Mingus is sort of. Uh, color saturated style as well coming through quite nicely all very very blue like again very serene very calm a little bit yes. like dollar shrine but actually a very devastating sight <laughs> which is kind of terrible um i really like it i think the more ixlan lands we can get especially to with the pirates the better because as much as i love jungles and as much as i love dinosaurs pirates 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 mate do you know what i mean pirates pirates it's, it's, who doesn't like pirates exactly <laughs> <laughs> so yeah the more the more i can see the better especially if they're dead pirates floating in the water i love all that mm. that's great um yeah what do you think of this one so i really i, I again the color palette is really bright and bubbly they could have gone dark i mean because obviously they were all originally in um at um dimir right they were all within the dimir um uh guild so mm. they were all very dark dank horrible kind of um uh system like kind of things right it's big Again, I'd like gloomy architecture, but I mean, this was this almost feels the opposite, right? It's a really open space. There's no closeness to it. As much as they are suspended, you know, in water, dying, like it does, as you say, it has that serenity to it. It has a nice, bright feeling. It's even this little coral in the corner, kind of keeping it. It doesn't feel very gravy. I know it is, you know, dead bodies and everything, but it doesn't feel well, very Well, that's interesting because uh, I often think, because I'm looking at all the Ravnica ones now, and I must admit, I've always thought, because there have been actually quite a few printings of, of Watery Grave. Um, I say that they've only been on Ravnica there have been the uh the expeditions the from zendikar yes so technically yes. technically there have been non-ravnica ones but obviously those were similar those were specifically for zendikar um none of the ravnica ones look particularly gravy either they're all just the the undercity where the golgari and the demir kind of hang out so it's not not very gravy either just a bit waterlogged yeah, I'm looking at the Gatewatch one specifically. It's it's quite ominous. Like, it's, there's more architecture than there is water, and I think there is like a dead dude in the foreground with a with a knife in his back or whatever. Um, mm. But I guess yeah, this does actually maybe feel more gravy than anything else. Um, I think my choice for like a favor movement kind of played into this even more. Um, and I think you've probably gone for the same thing. And I've gone for Innistrad, uh, Nefalia, uh, and then the Nefalia kind of drown yard, as it were. Because I feel like it's almost the exact same theme, right? Of mm. where it's loads of shipwrecks and everything. There's even like the sea graphs, right? The um, the 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 sailors that have died at sea that come walking back to shore. Mm. Um, you know, like rise of the um, oh, what's it called? Rise of the shit. Rise from the tides, right? There we go. That's sure. It kind of shows all of the zombies kind of walking out from the ocean. Um, I think that kind of fits it quite nicely. It's a bit more like um, I think it would be a bit more dark, a bit more drab. It would feel a little bit more closely associated to the dimmer side of where I'd, I'd feel I'd make it a bit darker. It could even maybe be like the grey side of, of show the remnants of where um, Emrakul was summoned. Mm. Um, so obviously all of the, um, where the where the Hira used all of the cryptoliths to kind of summon her into the Nefali Drown. It can almost like show it kind of falling into disrepair there and how it's affected the um, the environment. Um, it's very similar though, like it's a very similar flavour beat as it is to um, what we're seeing on the Excel So I don't think it's a necessary sidestep. Um, I just think it may be the other option I had was Shadow More. Like you could have seen like the Marrows, like the Ink Oh, that's cool. Because what I would have uh, liked to see maybe potentially is because there was a duality. They had um, Wonderwine, Wonderwine Hub, which was the show card where you had to show a merfolk. It was white blue lands and it would come into play taps unless you could reveal a merfolk. And then they had Sunken Ruins, which was like the Ink Fathom side. Um, that was the black blue filter lands. And they had kind of the two different sides. I could have seen like a Hallowed Fountain showing like the Lawwin Marrows. And then you could have had like Watery Grave showing like the Ink Fathom Marrows. Mm. And maybe you could have duality there. That's a little bit, that's a lot of Lawwin, considering they didn't do a single Lawwin card in any of them. Um, it's quite obvious where I have my biases sometimes, isn't it? Yeah, mate, you just need to like, you just need to stop living in the past, mate. Kamigawa. I just get over it, right? Just get, I know, get over it. I know. Just fucking go over it. Fucking hell. We've I know. got new such, planes, such mate. We get new boomer. planes every set. Jeez, God, what's wrong with Kaltheim? What's wrong with Eldraine? Come on, get, get up to stuff. Well, talking about Eldraine, uh, that's where I've put my watery grave. Oh, look at the segue. Flawless. I love it. Um, I've split <laughs> the difference of the two ideas that you've had. So you were going Drown Yard in Nefalia and Merrows on Lawwin. I'm going for Drowning Merrows on Eldraine. <laughs> 
there's, <laughs> there's, okay. a, there's a card in Eldraine uh, called Drown in the Lock, mm. which is a blue-black instant, uh, and it shows a Merrow drowning a human in a lock, hence the, the name of the card. Um, and yeah, Clever. I want to see more of that. I want to see more of that. There's um, In the mm. World of Quest by Kate Elliott, there's a, a scene where the twins on their Wilded Quest um, are going up to Castle Vantress and Will spots the merfolk or the merrows, I suppose, in the water of uh, the big lake where Castle Vantress kind of lies. And it's that whole kind of like lady in the water being tempted in by mermaids. They kind of mushed all those different ideas together. Mm. Um, and it's very clear that the merfolk in Eldraine are, are twats um, <laughs> who drown people. Um, so I want to see that. Again, I think it's very similar to what they've done with the uh, Richard Army Mingus one in Ixlan. Mm. Um, but I think, yeah, a similar sort of thing. And I think it would play into the blue-black aspect quite nicely as well, seeing as that's not that wasn't a huge tribe tribe i guess in eldraine because they were focusing more on monocolor but the yeah, yeah blue black and that was, one was quite distracting yes because you've seen very siren like rather than merfolk like but i think most sirens have been ported into merfolks as their creature type anyway i feel like water graves very easy to flex into a lot of the spaces that planes rely on because i mean every time you go water and you do as you say have cars like drown in the lock they fit so flavorfully for blue black um, mm-hmm. it's kind of like a, a, again it's like a gimme like you could kind of flex water grave into a lot of places and it would feel very succinct sure. very good it's funny talking um, about sirens we'll have to do another creatures episode because i think what what magic's done just to kind of like because this is something i'm always fascinated by is that there's been not like a conflagration of mer- mermaids and sirens in fantasy. So the whole kind of w- who's entrancing you on a rock, a lot of people go, oh, it's a mermaid because they see a mermaid sitting on a rock and they think of the fish person. But actually they're sirens who are the more like bird-like people who are like calling mm. you in which Almost is like, like harpies right yeah very much they're much similar more similar to that so i think magic's kind of made, made a, the sort of technically correct distinction between sirens and merfolk slash marrow where merfolk and marrow are the fish people and sirens are the more bird-like people and that's why they're in sets like you know i mean they're in Islam, but they're also in things like theros or whatever because that's theros, exactly part of the world yeah. where they come from so yeah i just Exile i don't know why that popped tables. into my head but um yeah it's cool yeah no it's good it's good yeah good distinction um cool so next we're moving on to uh blood crypt um yeah. artwork by seb mckinnon um if you didn't know if you you, you notice it immediately you just go oh yeah cool seb <laughs> knocking out of the park once again um this is uh, obviously set on, um, um, it, it's set on Innistrad, um, yep. the flavour text being vampires invited to a soiree at Markov Manor are expected to bring a guest or refreshments or both. Yeah, love it. Which I like. I think this is like, again, this is like a nice, easy, very like tick. Can't can't complain about this. I, th- I love the idea of a soiree. I just I think it's such a cool word. French mm. words are always really cool. Um, it's also nice to see um, Edgar being shown in the artwork. It's kind of um, it's very similar to um, the Blood Crypt uh, from Ravnica, except obviously it's got um, a statue of um, Edgar Markov um, around a central central pillar, and there's blood fountaining out from um, force like like giant like faucet kind of things. It's, it, it's it, literally it, like the flip reverse of Hallowed Fountain, isn't it? It's, it's like yes think exactly of fountain but the horror version it's essentially that um and you can kind of see in the background there's loads of different uh people um here to celebrate i mean it's just it, it's it's full-on perfect innistrad vampire flavor mm-hmm. um it makes a lot of sense to tie it to him it's good to see that edgar is still um represented um maybe you would have liked to have seen bruno if we don't see bruno i'm still gonna, i'm still i'm riding this train of if you don't get your werewolf commander in innistrad then you'll be really <laughs> angry if i don't see a bruno um uh, Storm, strong Kirk uh, by um, in, by the end of the year. I think we're both just going to quit. Well, magic, we're doing so. four fucking commander decks for Innistrad. Like, so surely, I surely, one of them, surely, has to right? be one of them. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> um, so again, like the flavor for this is really succinct. Um, I didn't necessarily have like a uh, is it better version. The two options that I had, one of them was um, a very recent one. Um, this is Arcavios because it referenced the Blood Age a lot. I was thinking maybe we see like a remnant of the Blood Age, one of the temples from the Blood Age, similar to. Um, because we obviously had the blood avatars um, summoned within the mm-hmm. story. Spoilers if you haven't if you haven't read it yet. Um, <laughs> I could have like I would have to have seen like where these blood avatars would have existed within the plane before. <laughs> if you've managed, not if you've you know? not read the story or seen any of the cards. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right, right. I mean, like, yeah. Um, and then the, um, so I thought that was maybe a good a good way. Maybe that was a bit too recent. So the other throwback that I thought had been cool was to Chandala and kind of show an anarchy catacomb, maybe potentially the birthplace of the Chain Veil. Like that would have been quite cool. Yeah, because the, the other option was maybe. 
Yeah, exactly. Because they're really cool. We don't get much more of them. But for all intents and purposes, it feels like the chain veil has been dropped from the storyline. Because I guess it's almost like such a powerful MacGuffin. If yeah, they don't do too something much. big with it, they kind of just have to go, ah, whatever, you know, we'll, we'll create kryptonite to make Superman weaker kind of thing. Mm. You know, like it felt like that kind of idea. It would have been nice then maybe to get one more hint of the Anarchy scenes. We're probably not going to go back and see them again. Sure. Um, but, um, yeah. All right. Well, this will be pretty short. My idea for Blood Crypt was uh, an Arcavios. <laughs> Age of Blood <laughs> ritual place. <Yeah. laughs> so yeah. exactly what you said. <laughs> um, yes, I thought I'm maybe it, we could have had, if, if these weren't so depicted in the now, um, we could have maybe had uh, a depiction of Extus or maybe some of the Arik in one of their labs. But essentially, yeah, the same sort yes. of Blood Age, Blood Avatar aspect of Arcavios. Um, a bit like, you know, like the Mystical Archive Dark Ritual that we really loved from exactly that yeah. that in my mind i know none of them the those miss clark eyes weren't necessarily depicting our kv and um places or themes because they were meant to be from around the multiverse but in my mind when someone says the blood age there's <laughs> all these people coming up to me talking about the blood age from our kvs uh, I, mean, I, I can't stop her mate it's, it's can't stop yeah five times a day at least like, mum stop talking to me about fucking strixhaven <laughs> um <laughs> i imagine that dark ritual artwork um cool all right that's nice and simple keeping it real uh the next one down oh the return of the master nathan we have steam vents oh, yes. by john mm-hmm. avon who baby uh steam vents obviously attributed to the is it this one is very cool this is a bit of a throwback for you magic boomers nathan um this one is set <laughs> on dominaria and depicts uh some thran tech some big uh thran sort of like power chimneys like how you'd have in like a power plant or something uh and the flavor text reads despite being abandoned for millennia the thran ironworks still occasionally sputter to life and yeah we can see steam rising out of these big chimneys uh, and amongst some whirlpools with uh like sinkholes like maelstroms which i can't decide they look maybe like man-made like these sort of like watery sinkholes going into the yeah. ground they remind me of the uh, what are the what they called in Ravnica the zo the zo zo oh, the, Zy- the cynic zygots? things zygots zygots yeah. yeah it reminds me a lot of that of where it, it feels like they plummet down it feels like um that's where they draw the water in from right yeah. and then the water gets pumped into to serve the the, the mechanics of the um of the of the factory I mean these are essentially yeah these are nuclear power plants essentially this, this is what yes. we're looking at isn't it yeah 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 with them going into the nuclear reactors um yeah I love it it's kind of the steam vents out of all of them is the one which I think you're almost hard-pressed to find another flavour for it. Because Steam suggests technology to some degree, mm. right? Or, if not that, then, like, natural springs. This was another one. This isn't the one I went for my alternate flavour. But I was thinking maybe in my head Steam Vents could be on Thiros again, where it's, like, the hot spring baths, and you have steam yeah. coming out of, like, the architecture of the bathhouse, maybe. Um Similar yeah. to rejuvenating springs, so we a little got bit, from yeah. um, the commander set. Yeah, exactly. And it's, they, they, it does look oddly natural, right? The formation. I know it says millennia ago, so obviously there's a lot of um, greens of where like nature's kind of taken back over again. But it doesn't look super industrial. Like it look, it could have looked way more industrial. And I think yeah, the maybe chimneys look like they carved out the rock, right? Exactly, right? It feels like they've deliberately avoided uh, doing what they did with all of the Ravnikan steam vents, which are very uh, mechanical, very industrial. There's lots of uh, metal building work, and it looks very much like steampunky. Um, and I th- maybe I think they deliberately tried to subvert that and move away from that, which is why we get this more natural formation. Again, John Avon can't do wrong when it comes to land, so I mean, there's no complaint um, mm. from me in any regards. Um, did you have an, any others other than Theros that you thought I did, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I didn't do the Theros one because I've already done the Theros one. So all right, this is where we we spoke about this uh, very quickly in a few uh, episodes ago, where we started to talk about ether on Kaladesh, and we very quickly <laughs> stopped because we were like, we don't know how ether works. <laughs> we yeah, we're know. like, oh, let's talk about something we is it, actually don't. Is it electricity? <laughs> is it like what is it? So basically, like, is it so Kaladesh is the steampunk meets uh, Indian mythology plane, right? But it's steam. Mm. The, the steam oh. in steampunk, right? is there to be so the steam god okay <laughs> the steam powers the pistons of machines in steampunks so that's why it's all mm. still very like clockwork or whatever and that engine feel yeah right? yeah, that, yeah. That old school mechanics rather than electrics yeah as it were. and even if electricity is being produced in steampunk media it's because it's how it's done in like a nuclear power plant where the the heating element whether it's coal or nuclear fission heats up the water in the machine that then creates the steam that then drives the turbines and the turbines is what creates the yeah. electricity. Right? Gyroscopic so, energy. Yeah, 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 yeah. The electricity is the end point of 
the energy that's being used, the energy being nuclear energy or, or coal or fossil fuels or whatever. Whereas on Kaladesh, I don't think it is quite like that. So in my head, I was going, right, I was thinking steam vents could be the steam vents on some kind of like ether production plant. But the steam vents in Kaladesh, uh, sorry, the ether in Kaladesh is is the energy source. Yeah, it's can not you the boil result. ether? No, because they pick it out. Can you have it's ether steam? <laughs> no, because it's naturally occurring, right? It's, right, it's, yeah. And I think that's what they, they did that very much on purpose so that they didn't have to deal with a plane that was essentially going through an industrial revolution <laughs> that people are like, yes. oh, well, that's going to be global warming on Kaladesh because it's already... It's already there. It's abundantly there. They're not doing something to create the energy that's ruining the environment. So mm. this is all very much to say, I'm still doing it on Kaladesh, but instead of it being steam from the ether, we spoke about in our multiverse menu episode how they have coffee on Kaladesh. And I can imagine Amazing. that the contraptions and the machines they use to create this coffee with the ether powering them would create a lot of steam. So I'm having a Kaladeshian coffee house as part of Amazing. my steam vents. That's what like I'm a doing. panharmonic on sized uh, uh, percolator. Yeah, I, I can. That's amazing. Oh, I love it. That's brilliant. And of course, they need it because, like, you know, especially with, like when everyone's inventing stuff all the time, they need to keep their minds, you know, fucking wires with up uh, the caffeine. Yeah, that's brilliant. Oh, I like that a lot. I also thought of um, the ether as well, and I was thinking the re- the main reason I thought it's because I um, wanted something to go against what I wanted to do, which was Vrin. And go super steam, but go even further down that line, right? Go pure industrial, similar vibe to Rav, but potentially more like mm-hmm. polluted, maybe. So it's more like a dark and dingy feel. And that's when I thought, well, if you did it on Kaladesh, you'd have it be bright and bubbly, and it would be, you know, like um, vibrant rather than feeling like it's bad for the environment. Whereas I feel like on Vrin, it's almost like dilapidated. It's like that chugging. It's got like exhaust oh, yeah. pipe coming out. Vrin is out, very, Vrin is very much feeling. like diesel punk, isn't it? It's like um, exactly. Was it Mortal Engines? That kind yes, of thing. precisely. Yeah, yeah. Um, Because then uh, the alternative I thought was maybe you could have, had they not done Breeding Pool doing um, Ginger Taxius and Vorin Collects, they could have done um, maybe a potential like original plane of Phyrexia kind of maybe do that sure. and have like the, like an, one of the spheres or maybe you saw Urobrask and Jinta Taxius on the furnace layer of New Phyrexia kind of working that in there. Um, Again, I, I, I don't, because Ravnica does it so well, right? And because it, it does a steampunk side, and as you say, like steam vents kind of gives you an image in your head of what you're expecting. It's probably better to subvert it um, than just go with side of kind of like, yeah, machine making making the stuff do the mm. thing. Um, so maybe that's why I didn't want to go with the Vrin sign. I kind of, I definitely prefer your coffee idea. Um, <laughs> just something like light, I, more lighthearted, right? Like, we yeah, just see, exactly. Like, yeah. 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 Yeah, very cool. Very cool. Again, like Steam Vents, I think they did a great job with it anyway. Um, and again, it's this is one of the ones that's harder to flex around with. So I feel like Steam Vents does have very much have a Ravnican identity, um, whereas other ones very much could be anywhere. Um, so maybe that's, you know, a, fa- a, fa- a failing, a failing in the naming convention for this one. But it just does too much, says too much in two words. Mm. How dare they? <laughs> <laughs> um, cool. And the next one is... Um, Oh, this is probably one of the better ones in terms of flavor as well. This is Overgrown Tomb uh, by Ab- Adam Paquette. Mm. Um, flavor text. So this is based in um, on Fiora. Talk about conspiracy. It's funny that this, it, again, looking at this, it feels like we do have so much more flavor for a set like conspiracy than we do like Kylan. Um, the flavor text reading, Brago's tomb was first erected as a formality. Now it stands as the last memorial to a forgotten fool. Quote from Queen Marquesa, which, brilliant. Yeah. Amazing. I love this idea that the... Um, obviously he was a uh, spirit king anyway so he wasn't exactly he didn't exactly die when he did die it didn't exactly stop him from ruling um and i have the idea that they've let it like now his rule is kind of you know over with and done with uh, it's demonstrating like history and time passing uh, the encouraged dissolution of his tyrannical rule i think it's quite a cool quite a cool idea mm. um i very much think he could have done this with other with other it could have been done for a few other people but then i tried to think about like who else are like big prevalent characters that died that you, you that people would have been okay with leaving their tombs to kind of like fall into disrepair so i was thinking maybe eventually everyone just finally gave up on tormod's crypt and they, they finally realized he wasn't coming back or staying dead and they're just like ah whatever just let it grow over there and he's not coming back it's not mm. happening um i also thought maybe like takeshi konda like you know because he was such a tyrant of of um of kamigawa this is my like trying to shoehorn kamigawa in again <laughs> but it just doesn't fit because he was a mono white guy and i don't necessarily think it's a too far of a throwback so the other thing i thought which would be really cool is put it on zendikar have it represent one of the big um tombs that kind of is almost it doesn't necessarily bury all of um all of the people within it it kind of is like um, a monument right a memorial because so many people got dusted you know but the eldrazi just uh, killing people kind of didn't leave much remains so like this idea of where it's like a big collective monument that then because the plane is kind of 
having a resurgence and is growing back you know literally zendikar resurgent kind of shows the turning point of where the plane starts healing i like this idea of where it's a stark white almost monolith that suddenly has all of like this this the, the, the fauna and the foliage growing back again kind of showing that ravnica's and not Ravnica, sorry, Zendikar's kind of rebuilding, regrowing, and 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 taking the memory of its fallen past, um, kind of within it within itself. I kind oh, of that's like a cool that idea. idea. It's overgrown in a good way, not overgrown. In yes, like exactly. Not in a dilapidated. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. That's kind of cool. Yeah. Um, I went similar to your uh, your idea for Amonkhet, actually, for Hallowed Fountain. I went for Amonkhet as well, um, for Overgrown Tomb, and I. I I like. I just like the idea. And again, this is actually this is maybe also similar to my Gullah Shrine idea. I like the idea of having hints of how planes were before a major event. So Amonkhet existed before Bolas turned up, and it had a society and it had a pantheon of gods. Like that's why you have the Scarab, Scorpion, and um, Locust God are around because they were part of the Amonkhet gods before Bolas corrupted them. So I would like the idea of there being a building somewhere out in the the deserts and the dunes of Amonkhet, now that um, uh, Naktamun has been destroyed in that big thing, and we have just these kind of now nomadic peoples in Amonkhet kind of caravanning across the desert, they come across a tomb that was the resting place of the old kings and queens of Amonkhet that existed before Bolas came and corrupted the plane. So that oh, there's, cool. th- there's some like a valley of the somewhere. kings. Yeah, like a valley of the kings, exactly. So it'd be very much like to our real world sort of, you know, understanding of ancient egypt where you know <clears throat> british um explorers quote unquote uh um, <coughs> yes discovered uh, <laughs> quote unquote uh the tombs of the ancient kings in egypt um but yeah i, I quite like the idea of uh, having um who's the basri ket he's the white planeswalker isn't he yes um yeah, yeah. Him, maybe him uh and samut maybe comes back to him and ket they uncover like the ancient history of amun uh, amun ket very much actually like how in tarkir uh you had uh narset discovering in her kind of like uh, present timeline, now that the timeline's been altered, she sees hints and sort of histories of a timeline that was disrupted. Like you can kind of sort of see that idea. Um, if we go back to Amonkhet, I dollars to donuts. That's exactly the storyline that they're going to do. Hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah, yeah, hundred yeah, percent. Because I think that's one of the things that most players really wanted to see. Is like as a concept, it was really cool to kind of jump into Amonkhet when we saw it, where it's like at the death day, you know, it's like doomsday clock, like minute to midnight kind of thing. That was really cool, but it doesn't give you f- very far to go. Um, the fact they didn't completely destroy the plane and allowed for things like Crested somewhere and a kind of a hint of what it was in the past and potentially it's not going to be completely dead. You know, it can come back. I think, yeah, they, if they don't explore the past before that, I don't really know what else they can do with it because there's not a lot of interest, right? Mm-hmm. Whereas it's plundering the past of Amalcare, I think is quite an interesting, uh, an interesting concept. Hell yeah. Um, yeah, very cool. Very cool. I like we've gone kind of the similar similar veins on some of these um, on some of these cards. Of, I guess I guess it shows like even just the two of us like what independently we want to see from planes, some places that we want to see, and bits of and bits of law that we're missing that maybe they could do with filling in a little bit. Sure. Um, cool. cool. Um, I think it's you for the next one. Yeah, sure. So next up we have this one's pretty special, man. Uh, next up we have Sacred Foundry by Magali Villeneuve. Uh, mm. This one is set on Kaladesh. Now, when we had Magali Villeneuve on our podcast, um, she explicitly stated that she wasn't very good at lands, which is why she didn't get commissioned them. And this is one of the most beautiful lands I think I've ever seen in the game. She lying. She <laughs> lying. lying. Straight up liar. <laughs> I think I even called her out on it as well on Twitter um, when this first got <laughs> called out. Um, so this is, yeah, this is a foundry scene on the plane of Kaladesh. Uh, obviously, as you can imagine, lots of filigree. Um, very similar color palette, actually, to when she did her Chandra card for Kaladesh. And then was it Scrapper Champion was another card that she did? Uh, a red card? A card. Yeah. Do you know what yeah, I mean? I th- ooh, yes, I know. It shows, it shows the exactly fighter palettes. with the kind of the mech arms and they've got like they're standing in like a victorious pose. People listening will know the card I'm talking about, but it's very, it's all like pinks and reds and glowing sort of uh, yellows. Um, very like no, I mean, there are blue lights in the background, but there's no like greens or anything. It's all very red and pink, which is very cool. Prismari colors, really. Um, mm. And the flavor text reads, after the consulate's defeat, the forges were opened to all. Now inventions pour forth from Jairapur. Is it Girapur or Jairapur? Girapur? I think it's Gear. Girapur. Okay. Uh, Girapur, as freely as molten metal from the foundry. Um, so, yeah. So now we've seen that the consulate has fallen. Again, very much placing this in modern day Kaladesh. Uh, can't wait to go back to Kaladesh. Um, that seems like it'd be pretty cool. And yeah, it's a pretty simple scene. Like, there's not a lot of flavor going on in the artwork itself, other than there's people milling around making shit. But I just, yeah, I like the idea that this this artwork shows that there's like a lot of heart and a lot of like inspiration in the foundry. Yeah, for sure. I'm kind of surprised that they do 
So it's funny we we're, talk- were talking earlier, right, about Kaladesh and how like the um, how ether works, right? And the way I think of it now, I'm looking at this card is that ether is kind of like the the energy that runs the machines, right? But you've still got to find. You've still got to build the machine. You've still got to shape the metal. You've still got to melt melt it down. Um, as much as you might have life crafters and people like that that can manipulate the metal, they will still need the metal to be manipulated, right? So it's kind of mm. interesting to see a foundry as it is here, where they haven't just got, oh, we'll just take the metal in its pure form and form it. It's like, no, no, we actually have to, like, you know, there has to be Work some. It. Exactly, there's got to be some process engineering um, involved in it. There's even like little bub, like little um, pods of ether, kind of like floating in the artwork here. Um, and I'm interested to see if they use actual f- of what of how they create the heat. Right, I wonder if they use the ether to create the heat or if it's completely kept separately. Um, mm. Again, questions. I like metaphysical um, answers to things, but it is nice to see them actually having an industry that's a bit more traditional and conventional. Um, where did you where did you port this to? Where did you see this this fitting elsewhere? Um, I mean, again, I think I kept this one fairly simple, to be honest with you. I went for Kaldheim and the Forge of Axe the Dwarves Guard. on Skald. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, the Skald Dwarves on Axe Guard. Yeah, exactly. So we didn't see much of them in the narrative and storylines. In fact, we didn't see any of them. We didn't see anything of the fucking Dwarves on Axe Guard during the Kal- Kaldheim story, which was a bit of a mm. bummer. Um, and obviously making weapons and treating forges as places of like uh sort of hallowed ground if you like were a big part of the source like in any dwarf mythos but like literally the scolds of kaldheim their whole life's ambition is to make a great weapon as uh, as long with you know telling great stories like those are their two kind of big things so i think yeah seeing more of them actually seeing the process maybe seeing the process of uh the master dwarf making the tyrite sword because i know we got a legendary creature card for him we got the uh, saga um, telling the story of how Tybalt stole the Tyrite Sword. Um, oh, we got the forging of the Tyrite Sword as well, I guess, in another saga. So maybe we did see enough of that. But yeah, I just think, yeah, Kaldheim, Forge, Skull Dwarves. Again, you could put this on Theros. You could do Perforos' Forge on Theros very easily. Um, but yeah, that's where I put it. Yeah, I think it also plays more into like the sacred side of it, right? Like As much as on, Ka- on Kaladesh, the foundry side of it is the more important and prevalent side, the sacred side of it doesn't necessarily kind of fall, fall so much. Uh, like this gives me, it gives, whenever I think of, um, when I thought of like, when I, when I think of Sacred Foundry, I kind of think of like the hammers from the Thief games of where they deli- they specifically mo- mix their religious um, kind of pi- pi- piety with their with, the for- with their masonry and their blacksmithery. Mm. Um, so I maybe feel like it would have been better to be on, on Axe Guard specifically for that because they have more of a reverence towards their... Um, towards the way that they, they craft their weapons. Mm-hmm. So I think that's that was my, it seems like a no-brainer one. The other one I thought, if we are doing throwbacks to past planes, um, we could have done Wrath, we could have seen Wrath, uh, maybe. Like, uh, maybe we see, I guess, because this is a cycle of seeing the immediate history of planes right now, it doesn't necessarily fit. They could have been, I'd say, like a nice throwback, like we saw with the Thran, kind of going like, oh yeah, Wrath was a plane that did exist. Obviously it doesn't exist now because it was overlaid into Dominaria. Um, but that was the only other one I could think of because that plays more again into the foundry side of things. But yeah, for me, Kaldheim Max Guard was like, yep, absolutely. I'm, I was always, I forgot that it was Kaladesh when we were, when we initially um, re looked at these. In my mind, I was like, yeah, of course it's from Max Guard, mm. absolutely. Like, well, I don't know, where, I don't know where else I'd put it because clearly it's Max Guard. Then I got there and realized it was, you know, Kaladesh. And I went, ah, well, yes, I guess Max Guard <laughs> is, is the one I meant. So yeah, yeah, I think that's a very easy pour. Um, yeah, cool, very cool. Um, Probably the prettiest of the bunch, I think, in terms of like what I go for in from visuals. Um, I just also really like Boris Lands, so um, no complaints from me. Um, the last one, surprisingly, the only one that's omitted visually from the Hipsters of the Coast article. Yeah, I think uh, that was is, a mistake. <laughs> yeah, it's Stomping Grounds. Um, this artwork is by Darken, um, mm. and it shows uh, Tarkir. And this, again, felt like a bit of a no-brainer in terms of like... It makes perfect sense for it to be set there. Um, flavor text reading, Ataka and her subjects congregate on Iagor, the dragon's bowl. It is my duty to keep that bowl full. Surak, the hunt caller. Oh, uh, notably Surak. not... Yeah, notably not Surak, um, Dragon Claw, because this is the timeline of where he, little bitch now, he, 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 he uh, unofficial chef for, for the dragons, as it yeah. were. Fetch, fetchy boy. Yeah, I, I know. I, this is one of the things I found most interesting about Tarkir is to see the fall from fa- fall from grace between people like Zergo Helm Smasher compared to Zergo Hel- Bell Striker. Like, for me, that was really interesting to see the humans be the ones that get beaten down and kind of have like the reversal of their roles. Well, the, the humanoids, um, at least. Humanoids. Well, yeah, ex- well, yes, exactly. Sorry, yeah. The, the, more, um, the, the more sentient of the races, even though I guess the dragons are very clever. You know, <laughs> Just like, the ones that aren't dragons. If you're not a dragon, you're not getting a look in. 
yeah, I just found that it was very interesting to kind of see them flip the switch on that. I know people preferred. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I I, I don't know why people were angry about like about what Sarkin Tarkir, did. The storylines of Tarkir in the sets get so much shit from people, <laughs> like yeah. with Favor Forged and um, Dra- Ka- Dragons of Tarkir. Like people loved Khans of Tarkir, and then there's something happened where like half the player base really doesn't like the other sort of timey wimey shit yeah. and then the why other is it all the dragons we yeah. have enough dragons i think oh. Tarki is rad i think the storyline is great i don't understand what the problem is but a lot of I people guess, don't like it i guess it's a narrative retcon right so everyone that liked the original was like oh well why 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 did you have to retcon it into this other thing even though it is narratively justified whereas all the people that liked the, the retconning are like well why don't you just start with that in this first place why did you have to give us something else and check your, whatever do you try and please everyone and, and you please nobody apparently <laughs> so don't worry wizards uh, but yeah this is like i think it's really a really good one like uh, something that i feel like fits into a lot of different places right this idea of like a um a territorial um like hierarchy kind of fighting place like to try and like battle it out like, there's a couple of places i think this fits in really well with uh, the first one that i thought of was um on ixalan like the idea of in the sun sun empire where they have like the mm. training ground for their dinosaur steeds kind of like maybe she like adolescence kind of like fr- vying for like power and like you know like almost like how puppies and kittens like you know tussle and fight to kind of get an understanding of um of how like animals should be how it should interact with each other um the other option i thought and this is maybe a bit better is on ikoria maybe this is like the place where the apex predators like do battle like and this is where they kind of oh, like this is where cool. you are become the apex because obviously there must be some lore aspect as to why they are like the the like almost like the elder elder, elder beasts right almost um they're not quite at that level but they are apex specifically they have to beat off everybody else and fend off um the, any other struggles for power and i feel like this would be a good place for that to be decided you know um the red green aspect okay doesn't play into all of the wedges and all of the different triomes but i think it's a nice like imagine this being like the middle ground from all the different triomes where it's almost like a big arena so it'd be nice to see one the apexes be referenced somewhere mm. <laughs> somewhere within a story because you don't see them at all and it also nice to see them interact with each other like i could imagine like an artwork i don't know who you'd give this to because it's a big ask but this artwork where it's almost like all five kind of in a half like like broiled in battle you know like gra- grappling each other and flame breath and all that nonsense like, that just sounds rad in my in my mind mm. um cool. yeah, that was my that was my easy port over uh my port over was going to dominaria and seeing uh Keldon under radha's rule so oh sick yeah, yeah. so oh, we've I had like we've that. had three radha cards now so she should be a name that people even if you're not up on the dominarian history should be relatively okay with um and the fact that she's now sort of running the the Keldon barbarians if you like um and she's red green they're warlike people seem to work quite well i don't know i think this one's probably the most kind of um easy peasy one that i've done like without much yeah. more storyline but i just like i really like radha i think she's cool she she was a potential planeswalker i find all those latent spark planeswalkers the ones who didn't actually get to do it interesting characters right like glissa for example um, yes very very much so. so yeah i think latent planeswalker is one of the coolest like terminologies it's one of the things i really hoped we were going to see with kasmina where she's like oh um you know she had this there was this hint that she was like pushing planeswalkers and putting them through a process to like j- to develop them into planeswalkers that like latency of planeswalker sparks i think is maybe one of the more interesting things they could um, look at in the future alongside um the Fuck, what's the thing that um um and I can't remember his name. You know when you try and think of a thing and you're like, right, what's the I reference for it? And then you forget you. that as I well. I have no idea. No, I know, I know. Dove um uh Dav 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 and who what, what entity the entities oh, there we, we go. go Jesus Christ yeah so en- latent sparks and, and entities this idea of how magic's like individual law works on a base base level those are the kinds of things I'd be interested to see and um, Rada could still spark right there's nothing to say that she won't uh, I like, thought there's no spark get used to close a time rift oh yeah oh yeah 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 Yeah. i know see this is it it's like it's all this potential but now but like she gets to be a badass on dominaria and she's like the leader of people i suppose that's cool she is Um, very cool yeah that was it that's pretty much it but i think your your idea is a lot cooler (laughs) i think on that one I don't know because the thing is, I went, I went for like, the obvious thing of where because I literally thought gargantuans. What's the biggest creatures? And I went to like the two easy ones, which was Ixalan and Ikoria. And um, I actually prefer it, the idea of taking it on a microcosm level because stomping grounds, even within Gruul turfs, like the Borborygmus is pretty big, but he's not as big as you know, say like an elder, an elder dinosaur or whatever. So it's quite nice to have it on like a, re- a reduced scale, as it were. Like just as a stomping doesn't mean it has to. Imagine like for example, it was a rave scene, you know. Mm. 
or like it was i mean again i, I could have seen this like again i'm not meaning to, to harp on about bavlovia but like um the goblins there obviously do like the big like um they have a band like big big explosions right and there's um even a car that's like a, a gig um and, and instead it's like it's just it's just drums that are exploding and all the instruments are exploding like i could see that being almost like a celebration place instead of like a fighting place mm. right where everyone goes to just hang out and throw down and you know have a little dance off or whatever um that's way less cool than the first thing I said. Why did you let me keep talking? Um, <laughs> uh, maybe I just miss. Maybe I just miss going out that much. So I'm just like tra- transferring it into the game now. Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, <laughs> interestingly, my favourite Gruul land artwork, and it's not a uh, shock land. It's uh, the Gruul Guild Lake. The uh, was it Alexander? I'm looking at it now. Uh, Alexander Frostberg Gruul Guildgate, where it's just a door. <laughs> it's a door of a dilapidated building, and it's just the door that's been left standing. With all the rubble around yeah, it, that's and the, very good. the gruel uh, symbol's been daubed with paint on the door. Or at least I hope it's paint, uh, red paint. And it's got two, it's two uh, torch sconces are lit as if like the door is like, oh, please enter through our guild gate. They're still functioning. It's still functioning <laughs> as a door. Just by, <laughs> it's just yeah, I love that. So yeah, make that into a yeah. shockland. Why wasn't that the shockland? Like I like the stomping ground shocklands from Ravnica, but they're all just big. Like none of them have that joke. Do you know what I mean? They're all they're all just big destruction scenes, right? Um, well, I guess this is the point, right? Is where because we've seen the same shock lands done each time, and when we were talking about the Watery Grave earlier, I looked it up and like all of them do, all of the Ravnican um, Watery Graves do look somewhat similar, and as you say, maybe not as gravy as they should. Maybe mm-hmm. it's that idea of where they've fallen into the same beat and story beat with them each time, like Goddess Shrine is the same beat each time. They're kind of showing something completely different, which I think is a real nice breath of fresh air. And as I think it's one of the main reasons we want to do this in the first place and talk about it, because it's actually very interesting to see how they are represented outside of their plane, especially considering that they're able to, because again, they've got flexible naming conventions. And again, like maybe we don't want to see the same the same view of a hallowed fountain, even though arguably it is still very similar to to some of the other Hallowed Fountains. But yeah, I think it was a really good opportunity for them to take. And again, compare it to some of the other secret layers, it's maybe not so visually striking as a wall of text or, you know, like bright, like explosive 60s and 70s art styles, but it actually has a lot more nuance to it. And it's a lot more, it, it feels like they take way more care and attention. And they didn't have to do that, right? They didn't have to kind of find a way to port them out. I know they want to get, they want people to buy the products and Shocklands are always going to be sought after. It's a really nice way for them to go. Well, let's flex out flavor as well as art style, or, or as well as like frame style, or as well as rule style. Maybe let's let's focus on the flavor a little bit as well. Um, it's a shame that they, you know, relegate it to a secret lair when they could maybe do this across in, into the sets more. But I mean, you know, I'm not going to complain. Yeah, more as well. I mean, this is the kind of thing where if they were to ever deemed put shock lands into the uh, commander decks, do you know what I mean? Uh, yeah, exactly. Perfect. The they could do they this could instead. Do. Yeah. yeah, yeah, they won't ever yeah, do very that. Cool. That's fine. No, um, no, cool. We'll, yeah, I like no. them as well. Do you have a? <laughs> do you have a favorite? If you had to pick a favorite. Oh wow! Uh, based on what flavor or f- or, or or art? I don't know. I'm not your dad. Different do answers. Whatever you want. Fucking hell! All right, Jesus Christ. Um, sorry, <laughs> I like Steam Vents because it doesn't look like a red, uh, blue land. There was another land off the top of my head. I can't think of what it is. I think it's the Pain Land, where it doesn't Sheevan Reef, of where it doesn't mm. feel like a red, blue land, and that's why I like it in the red, blue border. So I think visually, I prefer that one. In terms of flavor, I think Overgrown Tomb is really clever. Um, mm. A kind of a demonstration of, of of time passing on a plane that we don't get to see very often. Um, very cool. Any any more quotes from Queen Marchess is a, a, never a bad thing. Mm. Um, so yeah, yeah, I think Overgrown nice Tomb is probably. Highlights probably my flavor win for this one uh that's probably my favorite i mean magali villanue's sacred foundry is it's just beautiful it is yeah. just beautiful it's a hard pick right like i like i like i think i like all of them i said again temple god is maybe my least favorite just because i think it's the most generic i, I don't like selesnia out of all of the guilds the most so i feel like maybe it's bias um instinctive bias otherwise i think all of them are really really cool mm. um yeah i can't complain Cool. Well, let's hope they uh, they keep changing up more is more. So that's uh, always cool. Um, all right, guys, mm. that'll do it for our Shockland discussion. Uh, let us know what you thought of the Shocklands on Twitter. You can find us at MT Flavoring. Uh, my personal Twitter is at Andy Manface. Nathan's yours is at the Fox in the Moon. Emails go to mtflavoring at gmail dot com. Um, yeah, I, t- I'm, I'm, I might be taking apart my Karen Metro deck, Nathan. What do you feel about that? Um, I feel like. Maybe we're in a renaissance, you know, because I've recently taken apart my Brea deck. I feel like maybe we're at a point of where they've had enough, enough influx of, of, of cool new stuff that it's time for the old stuff to be lost and forgotten. I think Nakuz is going to go the same way. I'm, I might just move on with my life a little bit. Mm. Um, it'll be sad to see. I like your Karametra deck a lot. Um, it's a, it's a, a, a truck to play against, that's for sure. 
Um, yeah, well, I've tried. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, I think I've 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 seen a couple of different voices from people I respect when it comes to EDH building that have sort of not compl- complains the wrong word, but maybe um, expressed uh, boredom, maybe at value decks that are like land based value decks. Because unless you're playing like a deck that's kind of maybe comboing off with land synergies, if it's just literally like you get a reward for every time you play a land, which is what my character de- does. It's got a lot of landfall. Every time you get a creature, you get a land as well from her own ability. So it's just kind of rewarding me for playing the game as is. And I think as much as I don't, I don't necessarily hate that. I have played this deck for like three years now. So maybe, sure. maybe I need to free up the pieces for something else. So we'll see. Yeah. Cool. All right, then, guys. I think that'll do it for us. Uh, all that remains for me to say is thank you so much for listening. This has been Magic the Flavor. We'll see you soon.